All right, everybody, we are live. This is the Apologetics Empire. We welcome you to the simulcast that we're doing. Uh, for everybody who are watching and may want to do the super chat, questions will not be given priority, but we will appreciate your support. So continue to support. We got a lot of uh, great apologists here. And our goal here today is to introduce you to um, everybody's channel and also to bring you some great Q&A time. So right now, I'm just going to pass it around, pass the mic around, and I'm going to get um, inspiring philosophy to tell us a little bit about himself. Hey, um, I'm Mike Jones. I run Inspiring Philosophy. I build graphic intent videos as we build an apologetic video library. Good evening. My name is Joseph Backholm, and we create visual talking points to help Christians answer questions about faith and culture, and the channel is What Would You Say? Hey, my name is Mike Winger, and I help you learn how to think biblically about everything covering deep topics of theology and apologetics, and my channel name is Mike Winger. Hey, everybody. Sean Hurst. And our ministry is designed around two things, martial arts and apologetics, where we deliver apologetic content using martial arts as a delivery vehicle. And that new apo uh, apologetic ministry is mixed martial apologetics. Hey, guys, I'm Cameron Bertuzzi. I'm exposing you to the intellectual side of Christian belief. My YouTube channel is called Capturing Christianity. My name is Vocab Malone. I like to presuppositional, polemical, urban apologetics, especially towards my friends, the Hebrew Israelites. And you can find me at youtube.com slash vocab Malone. Y'all know what it is, man. It's your hometown hero, the real Adam Coleman of True Idea Apologetics. And I'm all about helping folks engage objections to Christianity and alternative worldviews that have been taking, gaining traction in the African-American community. My name is Brett Kunkel. I'm the president of Maven, and we help uh, you disciple your young people uh, to know what they believe, why they believe it, and why it matters. And uh, all our channels are maventruth.com. My name is Bobby Conway. We have a YouTube channel called One Minute Apologists. We take complicated truths and explain them in simple fashion. I'm Frank Turek. I don't have a voice, but I work for this guy, the great Jorge Gill, who does everything well. And my claim to fame is I'm sitting next to David Wood. That's a good claim to fame. Um, David Wood, make the dopest of the dope videos, Act 17 Apologies. And my channel name is What Do You Mean? All right, well, this is everybody here. This is a, a, an initiative. We're doing a, what is called a mastermind today, and we're getting uh, together to make sure we figure out a way to give you guys the best content possible. So right now what we're going to do is we're going to pass around the microphone, and everybody who's on the other side asking questions in the comment section, uh, uh, each one of these guys are, is going to, uh, answer your questions as they see fit. Uh, going to pick the question, the best question in the comment section, and they're going to uh, answer it live for you. So who wants to? Is it? Okay, so output sentence. I can change it. Yep. I can bring it down to four something. Okay, I can bring it down to 480. And okay, boost the audio. So that'll be something we can. Oh, I can do it here. Yes, and uh, what I'll do is uh, okay it. And uh, yes, just just did it. So. And the audio, I'm going to boost it. Da, da, da. All right, everybody, please bear with us. This is a uh, first experiment, and we got to make sure that everything goes well. So mic check, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Mic check, one, two. Probably f because of the buffering. What about now? Everybody can hear us. Mic check, one, two. Mic check one two. Mike yeah. Mike check one two. No, the buffering is done. The 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 thing is working. Good. Yeah, it's working. yeah, it's working. I mean, we got good stream. All right. So, uh, let us know. We're trying to you know adjust as we go, fine tune it, just like the universe. 
And, uh, and then we're, uh, okay, so who's going to be the first here? Anybody's got a question in their channel? Still letting them populate. Now. Okay, so question a question for David Wood. What's the best way to get started in apologetics to combat Islam? Check, 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 check. Um, yeah, best way to get started would be to, one, I would say, you know, study as much as you can. You know ahead of time what issues are going to be brought up. People are worried that they're not going to be able to know all the kinds of objections that are going to come up. But guess what? Muslims bring up the same five or six objections over and over again. So if you get ready for your Bible's been corrupted, um, the Trinity doesn't make sense, uh, where did Jesus say, I am God? Um, thing, a few issues like that. Hey, if, if you believe Jesus died for your sins, does that mean you could sin all you want? If you get ready for those few issues, um, that's a good start because, you know, 98% of the time, those are the things you're going to hear. Apart from that, I would say learn on the go and don't think that you need to know everything ahead of time. Uh, if you start um, by asking Muslims questions, asking them what they believe, they'll give you answers. If you ask them why they believe these things, they're going to give you their reasons. And I would take it from there. So once you have a Muslim friend and he's given you some reasons for believing in Islam, I would take it and uh, go back, study those reasons, and then get back to him. And then so start saying, hey, you know, you brought up the other day, you said the Quran's been perfectly preserved. I looked that up and I had some more questions for you. So uh, I take it like that, kind of learn on the go. And if you keep doing that, then uh, you'll, you'll realize that you're, you're pretty well equipped uh, over time to... Uh, to get into, to deal with Muslims on an apologetic level. Not that difficult. Okay, no, just uh, for people from here on out, what we're going to do is um, we're going to be looking around to see who is ready to answer a question, and we're going to keep it moving, guys. We got a lot of questions. Also, we got a lot of brain power here, and, or should I say mind power? Which one is it? Either, either mind or, power. mind power. So, Trying to be correct here, Better, right? Yeah. So make sure you check your channels and make sure that we we get this we get this going. So for IP, yeah. Uh, what does IP think about Walton's Lost World of the Torah? Can you repeat the question? Okay, so the question was, what does IP think about the Lost World of the Torah? It's a great book. I read it last year uh, when it first came out. Um, Minor disagreements, of course, as with anything I do read, but uh, he really goes into the Torah itself and how it was understood in the ancient Near Eastern world, how they looked at it. Um, it wasn't like a, a law code like we have it today. It's not like, well, let, someone commits a crime, let's pull up the uh, Torah, let's see what the sentence is, and let's execute it. That's a big misconception. Uh, he uses a term elsewhere in his work called, it's, it's, it's like a treaty on judicial wisdom. Think of Proverbs. Proverbs is like a treaty on moral wisdom. The Torah was meant to teach what justice was. That didn't mean it, it was like giving the minimal sentences. It, it taught through case law. Here's an example of what happened. Here, given the circumstances, we thought to do this. They were trying to teach justice. They were trying to teach morality. They were trying to get people to be wiser. That's the way you got to think about it. So I highly recommend you pick up the book. It's a great introduction to better understanding the Torah. You don't have to agree with everything he says. I have some minor disagreements here and there, but I, I highly recommend it. Anybody have controversial uh, or contrary thoughts on that that you've shared? Uh, well, no. Let's let. Well, I would say I would say let's go ahead on and just uh, cater to the to the audience by answering the, their questions. Yeah, I don't see a lot yet. Okay. So, but you got one. Okay. All right, from Jesse Harris. How do you engage apathetic friends, people who don't feel the need for religion at all? Uh, I would say a couple of things. Uh, number one, I would ask them the question, why are you apathetic about these things? And that might help you uncover the reasons why they're feeling apathetic. It might be they just want to avoid it. Um, it might be they just don't care. Uh, and that will then tell you kind of where to, to, where to go with them. So you, number one, you ask them the question. Uh, uh, number two, um, I think sometimes... I think this may be one of the most difficult challenges of someone who doesn't care. So sometimes you actually just have to wait. You have to just be patient until they get to a point that they eventually do care. So just because they don't care now doesn't mean that they won't care later on. Uh, and so sometimes you wait, and actually you wait for life to kind of beat them up, or you wait for them to struggle and and then that oftentimes will they'll, they'll start to care about these things. And then number three, throughout the entire process, you pray for them. 
and uh, and not just give this lip service. I think we as Christians give prayer lip service. You pray for them. I had a friend who I prayed for for uh, a, a number of years because of their apathy towards Christ, and uh, and then I started praying kind of aggressively. I prayed that they would specifically experience difficulty, and then the Lord brought difficulty in their life, and I they were much more open then to then talking about spiritual things. So. Oh, um, I have a one on my channel that I was given. Let me read this one to you guys. So this is coming from uh, from my channel, Mike Winger. Yeah. Um, hey guys, uh, there's the question. Says this: Should textually suspicious passages in the Bible be used to support theology or doctrine? And uh, one of the examples that was given is First John five verses seven and eight, which is a typical Trinitarian support passage that very, very likely was not in the original text. And because of that, I, I mean, I think the answer is no, we, we probably shouldn't be using a passage that we think we have really strong reasons to think it probably was not original. It was probably um, an interpolation or commentary that, that maybe a scribe didn't know what to do with. They weren't sure if it was original or if it was just commentary on the side, so they just incorporated it into the text or something along those lines. Those types of things can happen. But we have really good reason to think that that was not an original passage, um, like really strong, strong support. So we shouldn't use that. Now, does that threaten the doctrine of the Trinity? Like, by no means. We have such incredible evidence for the, doc the doctrine of the Trinity throughout all various passages of Scripture, which is one of the reasons why you don't want to use a passage that people can say, hey, that's, that's probably not original. Um, so it freaks people out a little bit, but when you study it more carefully, you realize it's just wise to move on to other uh, passages. Somebody else? Yeah. Over here. Yeah. There's a question. Uh, about somebody was talking to a friend <clears throat> and was trying to say that relative truth was true and they kicked in the roadrunner tactic and said, is that relative truth? And the person changed the subject. What do I say? How do I reword it differently? I would just stop and, and say, hey, do you mind if we go back to that point you made about relative truth? I mentioned that it's self-defeating to say that. Does that resonate with you? Do you kind of get what I'm saying. It's kind of like saying I can't speak a word in English. And just in a kind way, just say, we kind of glossed over that. Can, you, can we go back to that? Because detecting self-defeating statements is half of what you need to know to defend the Christian faith, because there's so many false statements out there that are just self-defeating. They're logically impossible, and yet people believe them. And so don't let them move on to another topic just in a kind way go back to that topic and see if they get the point i i have one more here and then i'll be really quick um it's from joshua who's the earliest mentions of the gospels only quote them not name them well paul technically quotes from the book of luke in first timothy uh so chapter five i believe uh there's also possible allusions i believe in Clement of Rome sometimes, um, also in Justin Martyr, there's a lot of allusions to the Gospels. He refers to them as the memoirs of the apostles. So you can talk about those. Those are some pretty good sources for that. Who's next? All right, so I've actually had a couple of people ask this, and the basic question is how important is it to get a degree in an apologetics-related field, what advice would you give for those thinking about a degree? So I think this is going to be a kind of subjective thing. It's going to be different for everyone. It depends on what your purposes are with your ministry or what you're aiming at doing. I've actually thought a lot about this myself because I come from photography. That's my background. And so I've, I've wrestled with the question of do I go to school? Do I get, try to go for a, a master's or a Ph.D.? in some like philosophy or in some apologetics related field. And for me personally, I've decided at least at this point to not do that, to just do ministry basically full time. And what I'm doing right now where I'm interviewing people a lot and I'm basically highlighting the work of really brilliant Christian philosophers, that's what I'm focused on right now. So I think it's more of like a personal thing that you've got to work out in your own life. What What is the purpose of it? Because there's really two things that you could do with a degree, or there's really, I guess there's two ways of looking at it. So what are you going to do if you do get a degree? What's the purpose? Are you trying to gain, an, are you trying to gain knowledge? Are you trying to gain sort of clout if you were to speak at churches? And I think there's, those are the two things that I was looking at. And so for me, what I would be focused on if I was to get a degree would be the knowledge part of it. I would want to have more understanding of the field of philosophy, of philosophy of religion, 
And so ultimately I decided if I was going to do that, that's my goal. I can just read books. I can get really great books and I don't have to, to go into debt and to, to get a degree, but it's, it's ultimately up to you what you want to do with it. And also the realize that the job market for a philosophy professor, you know, something like that, the job market is very, very competitive. So that's something else to keep in mind, what you're going to actually do with the degree. And I know that a lot of people here will, will probably have some thoughts on that, but we'll pass it on. Me, uh, actually, you know, I, I do full-time ministry. I work for, you know, Cross Examine, and uh, oh, he said he works for me, so, you know, uh, and uh, what school has helped me to to realize is that I have all these ideas in my head, and I got all these arguments, and I know all these concepts, and I read, 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 and uh, being able to sit down in a classroom and have that flush out for me and and put together in categories and have a a, 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 a controlled way to learn and to, and to put these things in order, in order for me to understand a little better, um, has helped me a lot. So it all depends, like Cameron says, what are you trying to do with this? Is this just uh, for you to serve in the local church? Is this for you to go and try to get a, a, a professorship somewhere? It, I think that it's on the on a, uh, individual basis, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis. So in my case, I, I want to do this, but I'm doing ministry at the same time, so I only take one class at a time. And it might, might take me 10 years, but I'm already in the field doing this. Now, for a person who just wants to get in the field and, and is not um, – don't have a schedule that is super full, then you go ahead on and you can go to school if you can afford it. If not, if you're already doing ministry, figure out there are other ways like online uh, uh, courses that you can go. You can go to onlinechristiancourses.com. We have some stuff over there. There are uh, a lot of uh, other ways you can go and audit a class if you're uh, interested in a particular subject. But at the end of the day, it, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish with this education. Yeah, go ahead. Let me see it. We got a super chat. Um, so we got a super chat. Want to say thank you for that super chat. What is Chris Date's view on hell, and what are our thoughts on that? Uh, Chris Date is a conditional uh, immortality. Uh, that's kind of the position he holds to. Uh, also known as annihilationism. Uh, if you're interested, go to our channel, One Minute Apologist. Uh, there we had Frank Turk on, and he talked about eternal conscious torment, and uh, he gave several, uh, you know, answers to questions I threw his way. And I also had Chris Date on the program, and we probably got about a dozen to 15 videos with Chris Date. Uh, Chris is, uh, I, I would say this, like I, I'm this guy that I'm open to just studying the scriptures and, and continuing to look and learn all that I can. I think he's a, a great guy. I would say that uh, he's a he, I would differ with him on being a five-point Calvinist, where I used to be one. Uh, he's a friend. I, I, I love Chris, and I do think that when it comes to this particular view, uh, you know, you had John Stott building out an exegetical case. Uh, you'll have other thinkers that will look at it, and they'll build an exegetical case, and I don't think they need to be demonized from the standpoint of like, oh, they're, they're not Christians, or they're teaching completely heretical. I think that you can, uh, that, that's an option that people have, and they can build a biblical case. And I've been an eternal conscious torment guy uh, throughout, uh, you know, most of my believing time. Right? That sounds terrible. Uh, but I, but Chris Date, I want to study what he has to say. I just haven't had time because of uh, being, you know, engaged in my research for so long. Um, but I will say this: when I wrote Hell, Rob Bell, and What Happens When People Die after his book Love Wins comes out, he was being accused of being a universalist, and I said, no, I think he's more of a postmortem nuance purgatorial inclusivist. And so. Uh, uh, if you're interested in that idea, I think that you've got that view, universalism, and I, and I think that those would be outside where I do think you can build a case like Chris State, and you're totally and thoroughly in. So I got a question from Carmel Crump. Uh, you know, shout out to you, thanks for uh, for tuning in. So the question is, do you think it's important to study ancient Near Eastern culture to defend the faith? against the comedic community. So just to clarify, the comedic community are those folks who appeal to Egyptian spirituality, heritage, and philosophy to build the worldview. And uh, I would say absolutely yes. I mean, the Bible was written within the context of the ancient Near East. And so, you know, there's, there's one of the main strategies of the comedic community is, is to try to say that Israel, you know, wasn't, you know, 
uh, didn't come out of Egypt and all those kinds of things, try to detach them from that context. So there's all kinds of weights, measures, customs, and, and little nuances throughout the Old and New Testament uh, that attest to uh, <laughs> that attest to um, you know the the Israelites really being there in the ancient Near East. So we can just easily shut down those claims, and it's helpful to to know those kinds of things to um, to shut it down. So yes, I would say absolutely. Uh, somebody also asked, uh, "What's up with my hair? Uh, why that hairstyle?" Because uh, I like it. <laughs> so, so there you go. I just, I just want to say real quick, hi Carm. I just want to say real quick, hi Carmel. That's all. She she's been following me for a while. What's up, guys? So I uh, got a question on my channel on what do you mean. It says, or it's from Elijah McGrath. It says, what is the best way to witness the close friends? I struggle with getting a Christian conversation started. Yeah, so um, a couple of things I'd say about that is, first, you, since you're, when you're close with people, it can get a little awkward sometimes, but you want to meet people where they're at. So um, I would be paying attention to what's important to my friend and what they value. And, uh, and I would try to look for overlaps between that and Christianity and how it fulfills that, the, or how the gospel fulfills that greater than um, however else they're trying to get it fulfilled. Um, also, what I would suggest is starting off, or, sorry, is that, did you hear me? All right, there we go. Uh, what I would suggest also is um, there's a good book by Greg Kokel called Tactics, and this is kind of like a central, um, I'd say, reading for people who are interested in evangelism. Um, basically, you want to ask certain questions um, to try to understand um, uh, what they mean and where they're coming from. And that book gives some great points and some great tips for having those conversations in a non-offensive and a non-threatening way. So um, definitely check out that book. Um, talk with your friends and get to know them. You know, meet them where they're at, um, just as Jesus met us where we were at as well. So um, that's what I'd say to that. Thanks for the question. I got a... a, a comment here on on our facebook page by brian cardenas and he says will you guys say a prayer for you absolutely we'll pray for you we pray before we started this live stream and we will be glad to play, pray for you afterwards so uh consider yourself uh, uh prayed up for afterwards okay anybody else yeah so a question um we get asked quite frequently in, in our ministry has to do with certainty. And so I, I want to kind of clear this up, and I'm betting probably everybody here gets this one quite often. Um, this one seems to be coming up a lot lately. In terms of certainty about knowledge of God, whether or not we need certainty to know that he exists. And so I'm not going to unpack Cartesian certainty tonight. You guys can look that up. But just to simply say, no, we do not need certainty. We don't require that for any of our views normally in life. Um, it's, it's completely unreasonable. Most professional philosophers who work in this field would also not agree with that either. And that, that field will be epistemology for those of you that are interested in asking these questions. So just understand that, that, that a reasonable um, way to think about it is to think about the fact that all you need is some evidence that fits whatever it is you are um, thinking about. So for, in this case would be God, all right? And that God would be the best hypothesis for that evidence. And there are ways we can weigh that and handle that, and we can talk about that in the future if anyone's interested. All right, so I have another question. Oh, let me get the microphone here. So I have another question from, his name is Anthony Rowden. He's actually one of my patrons, so thank you so much, Anthony, for supporting me. He says, for anyone, how do we explain to others, especially in the church, the importance of apologetics? It seems there's a lot of resistance to it. So I actually interviewed Bobby over here, who uh, most of my viewers will be aware of because I just interviewed him on my channel. We talked about this very topic. So if you want to get a little bit deeper in this question, then check out my interview with Bobby, One Minute Apologist. But one of the things that he said in my interview with him that I really, really liked was he said, if you're not doing apologetics, well, how did you, how did you phrase this, Bobby? You said, Well, let me, let me let you say it. Let me let you say it. I think this is the quote you might be referring to. Yeah, the person who says apologetics isn't important has just revealed how little evangelism they are doing. There we go. So that, that was actually one of my favorite quotes from that interview. So if you want to watch the whole thing, go ahead and do that. But what I do when I talk to people about the importance of apologetics, I just tell my story. So the reason why I'm involved in apologetics now is because my brother became an atheist about seven, eight years ago. And that is the reason for me why apologetics is so important. 
is because it can lead to these really bad things that can happen where people fall away. And I think this is why we need an apologetics in the church is to make sure that this doesn't happen is so that people know that there is good evidence, there's good reasons for Christianity, not just to keep them in the faith, but to keep them believing something that is true. I think that's ultimately what we're all doing here is we want to believe what is true. It's not just about defending something we grew up believing. That's what I did when I first started to look into apologetics and philosophy was I wanted to figure out was, is any of this stuff even true? Like beyond just trying to defend something that I grew up believing, is this true? And so I think obviously it is after I looked into the evidence and the arguments. And so I think that's the reason why, at least in my own personal case, when I talk to people, the importance of it is because it, it does lead to people falling away from the faith and then later on sort of being averse to it, not wanting to be open to the arguments and to the evidence. Once you get into your position, it's a lot harder to get them out than if you can just sort of give them some of the reasons along the way. And I think the church has failed at that and it's going to continue to fail at that unless we, we turn it around. So. So, Frank, um, the question is the following. Given the current political atmosphere, how do you deal with believers that appear to forsake biblical principles in regards to abortion and taxation? Well, I don't know about the taxation question because there's nothing in the Bible about what the tax level should be with regard to abortion. I would ask them, how did they come to that conclusion? Why do they think that is a, a viable political position to get behind, that abortion is, should be legal? Jesus scolded the Pharisees who were politicians in Matthew 23, 23, where he said <clears throat> that you neglect the weightier matters of the law. You're basically tithing your spices, but you're neglecting the weightier matters of the law. And the, weighty, the weightiest matter of the law, of course, is life, because the right to life is the right to all of the rights. If you don't have life, you don't have anything. So if we're not out politically trying to support life, life of the most innocent and vulnerable of our citizens, then we're not really upholding the Christian worldview or just doesn't even have to be the Christian worldview. It could be the natural law worldview. We have to support that. And that I put it this way, that being pro-life does not qualify you to be a candidate, but being pro-abortion disqualifies you from being a candidate. You can be pro-life and be a knucklehead in just about every other area. But I think it's a fundamental requirement of a politician that I'm going to support is that that person be pro-life. If they're not pro-life, they're disqualified. Uh, yeah, we got a super chat here. And then uh, we also have one uh, for Michael. Um, but let me see where that went. I got it right here. You do? Mm -hmm. Michael, you answer that, and then we'll hit the super chat, and then we'll pass it on to Adam. All right, so since we're going to go into controversy here, uh, Jim Wick, John Wick's younger brother, asked, is IP the only theistic evolutionist in the apologetic empire? Uh, I don't know. Uh, we didn't really talk about that much. I mean, Frank thinks the universe is eternal. Yeah. Uh, isn't that <laughs> <laughs> K kidding. Uh, but, you know. We're evolving on that issue. <laughs> He says we're evolving on that issue, uh, but you know that's not a central core doctrine. Uh, I think we all here believe in an historical Adam and Eve. We all believe that uh, they fell and that Jesus came to redeem us from that, give us, offer us eternal life in the resurrection that is to come. Uh, so I think as long as we accept that, it doesn't matter. If you want more, uh, in a week I'll be in the Toronto area debating Dr. Joe Boot on uh, is evolution compatible with the Bible, and I'll make sure that's on YouTube. It's, it's going to be on February 12th, but I'll make sure it's up on YouTube, even after I have to upload it to my own channel after we record it and everything. So stay tuned for that, and I'll lay out some good arguments in there. If you want to know more about my view, see my Genesis series on my channel. I go over everything from Genesis 1 up to 6, and I explain how this fits with the theistic evolutionist view. And I don't even mention evolution. I just talk about Genesis and its ancient Near Eastern context. Hey, Bobby. Something on, on that? Huh? Are you, are you, are you jumping on? Yeah. Well, it's yeah. just that he's wrong. But other than that, <laughs> other than that, I have a question. <laughs> so it's um, the question that I, would, that I got um, a lot of times from Moises. So Moises, I just want to, thanks for your question. I'm going to answer so you can stop putting it in the live chat over and over again now. <laughs> but it's, um, it, what is the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit in Matthew 28 and 19? That's the question he keeps asking. Well, let me read the passage and then we'll answer it real quick. And think about this. What's the name that's being talked about here? It says, Go, therefore, 
and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus commands his disciples to do this. And I, th I think that the answer isn't that we need to assign a, a particular name, like it's a secret name that we have to figure out or know, something like that. I think rather this is a great Trinitarian verse. Because of the name, single name, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, this one name for three persons, how does that work? Well, the Trinity. Uh, God is, you know, one being, three persons, three and one. And I think that's a, a great Trinitarian passage, along with another, you know, 200 of them that we have in the text of Scripture for you. So, yeah, um, so thanks for your question. I'll pass it on. All right. Uh, Thomas Boards, thank you so much for the super chat. Really appreciate that. Uh, if the Gospels are anonymous, does it hurt the case uh, for Christianity? Uh, I would encourage you to read a book by Brad Petrie. Uh, I th really enjoyed his book, The Case for Jesus, and uh, I think he got his PhD from Notre Dame. Uh, he makes uh, the case at the very beginning. I haven't had the privilege and the luxury of looking at all of some of the, you know, uh, manuscripts, but he says, he, he, he actually goes against this whole idea that the Gospels are anonymous. He says, in fact, when you look in the manuscripts, they all have the name there. So he actually refutes it, and it's in his book, The Case for Jesus, the first few chapters. I found it fascinating, so I just would throw that as a book to read. He is a Roman Catholic, but uh, he does have some good stuff. And Frank, you do speak a lot on Gospels. Was there anything that you might want to add to that question? Because uh, I know some of the stuff comes up on campuses that you can think of. Well, an another book is the one written by Peter Williams, Can We Trust the Gospels? Isn't that what it's called, Mike? I think that's what it's called. Yeah, and, and, and one of the things he pointed out with regard to the authorship is he said, if you look at, say, Matthew, you know it's written by a Jew in the first century, even if it's not Matthew, right? It's, it's Jewish throughout. It's really written to the Jews. So I, I think even if it's not Matthew, it's a Jew who is an eyewitness. Um, <clears throat> oh, by the way, a little side note before I go to the question. Uh, I am seeing people note that the sound is a bit out of sync with the video. Uh, keep in mind, this is experimental, right? I was anticipating some technical difficulties, uh, but basically uh, Jorge got the program that allows him to live stream to multiple channels. We tried last week uh, with a lecture that Frank was given where we uh, put it out on multiple channels, had no problems there, but the question is, you know, how many channels can we go live on at the same time? So this is kind of experimental. Once it works, we're gonna see, you know, we're gonna see where to take it from there. Oh, it could be. It could be your garbage mic that has uh, Jorge's picture on it. <laughs> that's what happens. See? See? That's, that, that's what pride does, ladies and gentlemen. Anyway, question I had was... Uh, yeah. Question I had was from uh, Matt Hedges. He asked uh, how to refute the claim from Muslims that Jesus uh, was never crucified. And I'll give... Uh, there are lots of ways, but I'll, I'll mention three, three quick things. Uh, one, you can refute it historically, namely that... Uh, we have a lot of historical data on Jesus' crucifixion. Uh, even atheist scholars, agnostic scholars, Jewish scholars uh, treat Jesus' death by crucifixion as a historical fact. People like Bart Ehrman and the Jesus Seminar will call it one of the best established facts of history. So um, we know historically that Jesus died by crucifixion. So that's one thing. Two, you can refute it uh, morally because the Muslim response is no, he wasn't crucified. God made everyone think that he was crucified by disguising someone else and making him look like Jesus. And so this makes sense to them. They think, oh, you know, God put someone else in his place and this is much better. But what have you done? You've, you've turned God into a deceiver who starts false religions for no reason, right? I mean, so if you ask your Muslim friend after he points this out, so why do Christians believe that Jesus died on the cross? Who, who corrupted the message of Jesus and turned it into Christianity? You can't, on this issue at least, you can't point to the Apostle Paul or someone else. You have to point to Allah and say, Allah did, did such a great job tricking everyone that Jesus' followers even became convinced that he died on the cross and then thus Christianity was born. So you've got a moral problem if you're a Muslim and you're saying that, get, that God tricked everyone into believing that Jesus died when this means that God was starting a religion. Keep in mind, according to the Quran, Jesus' original followers were devout Muslims, so you have Allah deceiving devout Muslims into becoming Christians. Big problems there. And the third thing I would recommend is what the Quran says about 
the Jewish and Christian scriptures. The Quran affirms not only the inspiration of the Jewish and Christian scriptures, but also their preservation and authority. The Quran even commands Christians to judge by the gospel that we have, the gospel that we read. Uh, Muslims will say the Bible's been corrupted. The Quran says no one can change Allah's words. So once you realize that the Quran is sending us to the Bible, to the gospel as authoritative scripture, then they've got a problem on their hands because guess what? If we obey the Quran, then we judge by the gospel. We have to judge that Jesus died by crucifixion. Islam is wrong. Or if we don't judge by the gospel, we treat it as corrupt. We still have to believe that Islam is wrong because Islam affirms the gospel that we have. So either way, Islam turns out to be false. That's the direction I'd go. Now here's one for Bobby. Aya Trojic says, question to, to Bobby Conway, why didn't Jesus write the gospel himself? Well, that is a question that I cannot answer, but I can say that Jesus, he is the good news, and he empowered uh, his disciples uh, by discipling them, by spending time with them, by teaching, but he is the word that became flesh. And so when we look at his life and we study his life, there's so much to learn. I see uh, Tim over there uh, pointing people to the fifth gospel, uh, but that's uh, maybe a little bit different. But anyway, uh, what's that? Yeah. Oh, and Mike Winger did say a good point. You know, uh, it'd be hard for him to write about his death and resurrection before he did it. But he did speak about his death and resurrection before he did it. So I suppose he could. Right. And, you know, the other thing, too, we say that Jesus never wrote anything. Well, he never wrote anything as far as we know. We, you know what I mean? It's like there's times, uh, we, you know, he could have written a lot of things down, but we just don't know that. And we don't have it in the inspired text. Uh, Adam had a question for him a moment ago. And I just want to make sure we get it over. Hope that helps. Oh, cool. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I got a question. I'm trying to work, work my way through them one by one. Um, so just the next one down is Adam. This is really important, actually. Adam, are there any other apologists there with you that's addressing the momentum of the so-called conscious community among believers who are ethnically African Americans? If so, who? If not, why? Now, actually, I'm going to tell you why I think it's a great question, because first of all, um, you do have some guys in, in this team here who are directly engaging uh, the conscious community, such as Vocab Malone, uh, you know, you had David Wood, uh, John McCray, and so forth. Aside from that, though, you know, I think what's actually even more uh, fundamental is that all truth is God's truth. You know what I'm saying? And there's not one channel up here that I'm not, you know, gleaning from, learning from, and so forth. You know what I'm saying? So th I think one of the misconceptions is that what's going on in the conscious community is so alien to the other kinds of apologetic concerns is that we kind of have to create the, the uh, for a whole flock. Of, I said, I, you know, I, I endorse everybody here. But you know, to that, yeah, John McCray, uh, uh, vocab. I don't want to mention my vocab, man. <laughs> but yeah, all right, vocab. And uh, yeah, so I, I guess that's how I would answer it. Yeah. Somebody else? Uh, nice. What's up with this mic with your face on it, bro? It's on like two sides. You love it, bro. It's like two face. It did, Frank, did Frank approve? Jorge's face all big on here. All right, well, this one is actually from a man, Joseph. Joseph, back home. This is for you. I'll hand you the mic. I got it in my live chat for you. Uh, Joseph has a great channel, everybody, called What Would You Say? And the question is, what can we do to prepare our kids to withstand the onslaught of secular culture? Thank you for that vocab. And and what would you say what we do exist to do is help people answer those questions. Um, specifically, uh, w with kids in particular, parents, grandparents, and our, our channel does provide answers to questions. Um, how many genders are there? Is sex assigned at birth? Is an embryo a person? Those kind of questions we hope in about three minutes to be able to provide answers to, to parents for or to parents for for their kids and I think I think the answer to this question is um, parents grandparents have to be prepared for their kids because the reality is in the world that that, uh, that our children are living in they are getting answers that ultimately fundamentally challenge whether the gospel is reliable about gender about human sexuality about family structure those questions and and the accusation underlying all of these questions is did God really say and we go back to Genesis 3 are the things that God revealed to us in Scripture actually true? Do they reveal? Are, uh, do they apply to the world today? And if parents 
don't have the ability to answer that question for kids, then what, what's happening, I think, is kids begin to lose faith because the other side is super aggressive, super evangelistic, and really confident in what they believe. And if we can't provide a similar response to that, then I think what we are communicating without communicating is they actually have a better answer. They're more, com- they're more confident in what they believe than we are. And eventually, I think that's what the what young people are observing happen um, in, in these culture wars because, and, and as, as a result, are getting sucked into the mob because they, they feel like they know what they're talking about and they're really confident about what they say. And so from the parents' perspective, I think what we have to do is we have to be students ourselves of the culture, of the gospel, how the gospel applies to the culture, and we have to be ready for these questions so we're not afraid when, when the questions happen and we don't run away and try to change the subject because that's communicating something to our kids as well. So. I couldn't help but weigh in on this because this, may, this is Maven's passion, right, young people. Um, and I think given the aggressive secular culture that we're in right now, uh, in terms of the discipleship of our young, young people, we, parents need to start much earlier. Don't wait till middle school and high school to really think about training your kids. Start when they're one and two and three. And if I'm going to break this into some distinct stages that maybe kind of give a, a practical framework for this, I would say at those younger stages, you're really focusing on teaching the what, right, which is our theology. And we have got to lay a solid foundation of theology for our children because our theology uh, uh, provides our worldview, how we see the world. And so there is no greater area of knowledge that you and I can pass on to our kids than the knowledge of God. And that starts early on. And so uh, you're pouring into them this theology that's going to shape their worldview. And then that's going to help them then to navigate these difficult kind of cultural issues that they're facing. Because what I'm finding with young people is that it's not often the traditional apologetics questions that they're asking. It's these cultural challenges. So it's, it's, it's gender identity. My friend is transitioning in school, or I watched this YouTube video about gender identity. It kind of made sense to me, but that clashes with what I hear at church. But there's no explanation. There's no uh, undergirding strong worldview that helps them to make sense of this. So you, at that younger age, you're teaching the what. As they get older, then you add teaching the why. This is where apologetic uh, apologetics is so vital in the discipleship of young people. And you're also ha- in that process, I think, teaching them logic and reason. And, uh, and you're making space for their questions and doubts. And then by t- the time they're in high school, if you've laid that foundation, of course, you never stop laying that foundation, but you keep adding. You add the, the, the why to the what. But then thirdly, I think the, the thing that is often missing in our churches is then giving them an opportunity to articulate it. This is kind of like teach the how-to, and this is where we take these kind of uh, unique trips, these immersive experiences where we train high school students in apologetics or in theology, and then we take them to places like Berkeley or Utah to engage people who don't believe what they believe, and that really helps them solidify. And I think we've got to get more aggressive with our young people if they're going to resist this kind of secular assault. So we had a question from Matt asking how to refute Roman Catholicism. And so what I would say to you here, Matt, is rather than focus on a system, instead, focus on a person. If you've got somebody in mind that you know that's Catholic, which is what I'm operating under the premise or uh, inference here that is your question, focus on them and whether or not they're trusting in Christ alone for their salvation. Start from there, because that's the most important key fundamental part. Then from there, you can work out once you know that they're saved. But always start there at the salvation first, because if you start from the system, it may take you forever, and who knows what may happen to that person in the meantime. So hopefully that's helpful, brother. I got two, yeah, two quick ones. Uh, so one question I had was, where is Braxton Hunter from Trinity Radio? And uh, he actually is just, he couldn't make it, okay? He couldn't make it, scheduling conflicts, but he w- he would love to be here and maybe if we do this again he'll be here but i want you guys to go check him out braxton hunter his youtube channel is called trinity radio so go search his channel uh so i got a super chat from somebody asking a question to ip he says how do you respond to atheists who claim that theists say we don't know therefore it must be god 
Yeah, just, just for more information, I have a video on my channel called Abusing the God of the Gaps Fallacy. That will cover it a lot. Uh, what they're doing is a caricature of the actual arguments. No one here says that. No one goes, well, I don't know what caused the universe, therefore God. If you look at the, the Kalam cosmological argument, it's a the very basic argument. William Lane Craig is not doing that. If you look at my arguments like the digital physics argument or the cosmic conscious argument, no one is doing that. It's a lot of the same way that people would reason to the existence of gravity. No one's saying, well, I don't know why objects fall to the earth, therefore there's a mystical thing called gravity. That's silly. No scientists do that. They say, well, we have evidence of this, this force uh, based on the curvature of space of large objects that it would push objects down. And so based on our best available evidence, this is the best theory that explains the data. The same thing we do with theism. We have a lot of this good evidence, fine-tuning, cosmological evidence, consciousness, uh, moral realism, that's objective moral facts and duties. And we say the best explanation of this would be in a, a necessary eternal mind that is beneath or, you know, so to speak, or behind the universe that caused everything or brought things into existence. If the atheist doesn't agree, they shouldn't caricature the argument. They should just be like, they should offer a better explanation of the data that we have presented or they should agree with us, or, or they can just be agnostic. Just caricaturing the argument shows you they're not listening. They're not into actually trying to go through these arguments. They just want a quick, you know, little snappy thing they think will make all their followers cheer. But it's, it's dishonest. It wouldn't work in other circumstances like gravity or any, pick any scientific theory or any philosophical theory. But for some reason with theism, that's the way they go. But what they really should be doing is engaging in the evidence, saying, well, I don't agree with you. Here's a better explanation, but they don't do that. So if they're doing that, they're probably not worth your time. They're just trying to get this quick, like, kind of win and look like they're really, like, you know, charismatic. But they're not engaging with the evidence and call them out. A ask them to actually go through the premises with you. Say, where do you think I'm doing that? Why is this not the best explanation? What's wrong with that? And you'll see they won't be able to do it. I, I see in my debates as well. Uh, before we continue with the with the questions, just let you guys know we're gonna keep doing this for another 35, 45 minutes. Make sure that it don't matter where you're watching from, uh, follow everybody. This is the, the idea is that you go and subscribe to all the YouTube channels that are at, uh, going live right now. Is in the video description. Also, make sure that you leave your comments. You tag people in the comment section that you think it will be they will be um uh built with this live stream with these questions uh with these answers make sure that you support everybody here in this room and help us so because we want to continue to do this on uh you know as, uh, regularly so make sure that you do that follow everybody here subscribe and uh keep asking your, squ your questions in the in the comment section uh, so I got a, a lot of questions. Actually, I get this question a lot. A lot of questions about how do you stop sinning or if you're in some sort of like, you know, process where you just keep failing and you keep, um, you're just stuck in some kind of rut with sin and people are trying to get out of that. Um, there's a couple of things I can, I can speak to kind of like my life, I'd say, is that like, I understand what that's like, right? Being in that cycle. Um, and what I'd say is like, for me, a person like me, it doesn't help to just be like, um, tell myself to just stop doing that, stop being a bad Christian, right? You know, and I, I think about like even in Matthew 23, where Jesus says, you clean the inside of the cup because if you, um, and then you'll have the outside of the cup clean as well. And I think this is uh, represented over and over in scripture as well. Um, it's not enough to just stop these external actions because when you stop the external actions, you still have that, you know, whatever is causing it, the root of it is still deep down inside of you. So you want to clean that inside first and then it will clean the outside as well, as Jesus said. And um, a passage too that um, was helpful for me too was Galatians 5.16 where it says, so I say, uh, where Paul is saying, so I say, walk in the spirit so that way you don't gratify the desires of the flesh. And notice that he didn't say, don't desire, or um, don't gratify the desires of the flesh so that way you can walk in the spirit. Instead, it was kind of backwards, right? Um, so where he, what he's trying to, trying to get at in that passage is, is focusing on uh, the gospel, focusing on walking in the spirit. Like later Paul says, keep in step with the spirit. You're focusing on what Christ did um, and what he did 
And then through that, um, that's when these things start falling off instead of focusing on yourself more um, in those moments. And I know that seems super counterintuitive, but I noticed that in my life. And even there's a lot of passages, um, too, in the Bible, I think, that support this view as well. Um, but there's a consistent kind of theme in the Bible, too, where first you have to know who you are in Christ. Right. Um, if you even look at the epistles, a lot of the earlier um, parts of the epistles, uh, Paul, you know, is even saying like he's saying this is who you are in Christ. Now live in accordance with that. Um, so it's opposite from the way you typically kind of think about in the rest of like a lot of the world religions and stuff because they say that you have to just cut off the external stuff and then you can be holy um, but in christianity um, what you see over and over in the bible too is it's backwards not saying don't cut off the external stuff but um, your motivation now just comes from focusing on god and what he's done for you and that you have salvation through him and then out of gratitude for that that's when you start being able to stop doing these things for different reasons so, hope that helps. Cool, man. We got another good one. Uh, first of all, I want to sh say thanks for everybody who's in the live chat right now. Shout out to my man, BK Apologist, uh, Matt Jackson. Y'all should subscribe to their channels as well. Got some great urban apologetic stuff. But I have another question. Um, somebody says that the uh, my man, Benjamin Dixon, says he's preparing for um, an apologetics presentation. And he kind of wants some tips and, and kind of some guidance on how to go about preparing for that. Um, Hey, I guess it's kind of not a shameless plug because it's not my organization, but I would highly recommend CIA training, man, that's, that's offered through Cross Examine Ministries. I attended it uh, this, this, uh, this past year, and it was phenomenal. You know, learned a lot of great tips and tricks and stuff like that. With that being said, uh, we got the OG of Cross Examine, you know, in the house, you know, Frank Turks. I want to kind of hand this question off to him and let him uh, take a stab at it. Thanks, Adam. Yeah, we run the Cross Examine Instructor Academy, CIA to teach you how to have the voice of doing a presentation. That's yeah, it. Like That's what we do. So you want to be a part of this. <clears throat> Go to crossexamine.org, click on events. You'll see CIA there. It's August 6 to 8, I think, this year. It's a Thursday through Saturday. We'll have Brett Kunkel. He'll be there. We'll have David Wood. He'll be there. Uh, Bobby Conway will be there. Myself, Greg Kokel, Jay Warner Wallace. Jorge Ernesto Gil Calderon. We will have um, Alisa Childers there. Richard Howe, it's gonna be a great uh, event. We only take about 60 people because we not only present to you, you present to us and we need to evaluate you. Um, I had a quick question here. Uh, where is it? Someone, uh, I'll find it later. <laughs> Who has a question? <clears throat> uh, Hayden Tang. Hayden Tang is asking, uh, what can people do to help join or spread the apologetics empire? Uh, keep in mind, a few of us discussed uh, this meeting last year before I ever said anything about it, an apologetics empire. So we basically got together and uh, discussed uh, the people who are posting lots of content. What? It was CIA. We were at CIA, and I was sitting there with uh, with Jorge and with Bobby Conway, and we started discussing, uh, hey, what ha what would happen if the, the, the people, the Christians who are um, doing lots of apologetic stuff on YouTube actually got together, explored strategies, uh, you know, you know, we want to realize, hey, we're not we're not in competition with each other on YouTube. We all have the same goals, and so wanted to get together for something like this. When I posted the apologetics empire video really all i was all i was thinking about apart from you know christians working together like this was uh, i was just saying hey you know my goal down the road would be five six seven christians sort of living in the same area a couple of tech guys christian group that has all the bases covered there's a science guy a theology guy a bible guy and so on and these guys would just you know could go live every night as a group and then you know, it, it could be a free for all because they've got all the bases covered. And, you know, during the day, they could work on their own channels and stuff like that. And I believe because of technology, a small, well-trained group can just can just do phenomenal things. But after I posted that, I started getting um, messages from people around the world saying, hey, how can I be involved in this? And I'm getting these every day. How can we be, how can we be part of this? How can we be part of this apologetics empire? So just want you to know my plans are flexible, ladies and gentlemen. So the plans are flexible. So with that in mind, I started thinking uh, because I get messages from people, hey, you know, I live in Philadelphia. I'm a tech guy. Is there any way I can help? 
And so uh, we're taking these messages into account. So I have, if I'm not responding to your messages or emails, just keep in mind, I, I, I do see them. We are, we are taking them into account. But uh, uh, so the, the, the modified version, I'll still have the plan of, of what I was planning to do. But as far as other people, um, putting together a website, putting together a website, and part of the website is going to be training, right? Like training on, you know, how to get started on YouTube, what to do. Uh, but another part of the website is going to be uh, sort of a, a discussion group where people who are interested in sort of doing uh, what, what we're interested in doing um, can chat and network and so on. Because guess what? If, if there are four or five people living in Philadelphia and two or three of them are interested in making YouTube videos and one or two of them is a tech guy and one's a researcher or something like that, there's no reason they should not be getting together and doing the same thing I'm planning to do in, in my area, right? Working, getting together, working together, working as a team, putting out content. So, uh, yeah, guys, we'll be all that stuff will be happening this year. We're working on multiple, multiple plans, multiple avenues and stuff. And, uh, yeah, the result will be the greatest empire the world has ever seen. Let me, let, me, let me just deal with the question real quickly that I had. Someone was asking the question as to why are there people running around out there now saying we have to obey the Old Testament law? The answer is I don't know why they're doing that. But let me just say the, the answer is very simple. It's impossible to obey the Old Testament law because there's no temple. How could you, how could you fulfill the Old Testament law? There's no temple to go to. Not only that, Hebrews 8.13 says the Old Covenant is obsolete. Everything from Exodus 20 to Deuteronomy is obsolete in terms of its its um, effect on Christians today. Now, nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament, but the Old Testament law is obsolete. So don't put that burden on Christians. Even the Jews couldn't live up to it, according to Peter. Just read Acts 15. Acts 15 doesn't says you don't need to obey some of those laws from the Old Testament. Um. I want to thank Jay Jose for the super chat, and I would say to all, on behalf of all of us, I know some of you will be repeating your questions or what have you, and there's no way that we can get to all those because there's several of us, and so just know that uh, we're not even seeing everything that's coming through. We're just trying our best to answer a question and give everybody a little bit of space, but the question uh, from Jay Jose was, what is everyone's opinion on Christian YouTubers having dreams? about the rapture, and so uh, I would say we can't get everyone's opinions, but I'd like Brett Kunkel's opinion on Christians having dreams about the rapture. Come on, Brett. <laughs> right? No, don't put him on the spot. Hey, no, Brett would agree. Hey, we, I would say, uh, look, I, I, I can't help what people dream about, and no, neither can anyone else here, but don't wake up and write a book about it. Uh, I think that that's the danger. You'll get people have a dream about hell. They'll have a dream about heaven, or they'll see uh, an image that they think is a facsimile of Jesus on their toast, and they'll post it on YouTube, and uh, we just have to be so careful. I mean, you know, dreams are, are wild, you know. I mean, I love surrealism as a f form of art. Vladimir Kush is my favorite surrealist artist. It's where you combine dreams uh, with thing in reality. But look, we can go to and, and have a dream, and it can seem as if things are real, and we're in a dream state, and we don't want to wake up and superimpose our dream on other people. That's not to say that I don't believe that people can have a dream that could mean something to them and that God could end up working through it, but as it comes to the doctrine of the rapture, we have to be really careful that we don't start setting dates, that we don't start laying out the way it's going to look perfectly. What we have to look to is the scriptures, and we have to realize that uh, we have to be gracious on a on the timing. There's pre-trib, there's post-trib, there's partial preterist, there's mid-trib. Uh, so when we think about these different views, we believe that there's going to be a bodily return of Christ, but we're gracious with uh, one another as it relates to the timing. I got something. Yeah. All right. All right. So here's a question uh, from Jesse. Uh, when talking with people who are willing to engage on the level of ideas, I find that we typically can't get past our different epistemologies. How do you suggest establishing common ground regarding what is truth and, and how we can know it? Uh, great question. Epistemology is just simply the study of knowledge, right? It answers questions like, how do we know what we know? Um, what, what is truth or what is knowledge? Uh, what counts as evidence, these kinds of things. And so, for example, you might be talking to someone and you want to talk about 
God's existence or spiritual ideas, and they may say something like, well, I only, I only think we can know what can be scientifically proven or something like that, right, verified by science. Well, I think there's a couple things you can do in those conversations, uh, uh, particularly with normal people, right, who maybe don't have training in philosophy, uh, maybe even know what epist epistemology even is. They don't even realize they have an epistemology, right? a view about knowledge. But I think one thing you can do is, number one, you can show them that they, the epistemology they are trying to affirm, uh, they actually don't hold that view consistently by showing that there are things they claim to know outside of that epistemological scheme, all right? So for instance, a person says, I only believe things which can be proven by science. You might ask them, well, um, how do you know that, uh, uh, the content of your thought that George Washington is the first president of the United States is, uh, is actually the actual content. How do you know you're having that thought, right? Is it, is it something, uh, science, does science somehow tell you that? No, that's just through rational reflection. Or how do you know that uh, torturing young children just for fun is morally wrong or something like that? Or how do you know that racism is wrong? Is that through some kind of scientific method? No, that's just through moral reflection. And so you help them to see that there are things that they actually do indeed believe and affirm uh, outside of their epistemology. And so what you do is, uh, I think over time, you kind of crack open their epistemological door, so to speak. You, you help them to see they actually don't, they don't live that out consistently. And then I think a second thing you can do is you can show there's deficiencies in maybe their current view of how we know truth or, or how we know things. So for instance, the person who says, I, I only believe those things which can be verified scientifically, right? Well, one of the problems with that is that it's self-defeating. It's, it, it's self-contradictory, right? That claim itself is not a claim that can be verified by science. I mean, what do you do? Write it down on a piece of paper and heat it up in a beaker or something? I mean, how, how would you verify that and know that through science? You don't, you know that through philosophy through rational reflection. And so even the theory itself is self-defeating and self-contradictory. And so I think those are the kind of things you can do to help open someone up to um, being open to the evidence, kind of opening up their, their views on knowledge and truth. Uh, I got a question from Mario. What study Bible do you recommend for in-depth study? I thought that was an interesting one, and I always appreciate a question about deeper Bible study. If you just have to get one, I would go with the ESV study Bible. And the reason is, is it's not as sectarian as a lot of study Bibles and has multiple authors versus just one. For example, nothing wrong with the MacArthur study Bible, but it's more sectarian in its, in its views and it's only one author. There's advantages and disadvantages to that. ESV study Bible has experts who wrote the commentary for each book and they'll often give multiple views just in the study notes it's almost like a miniature commentary, but they're really good at making it succinct, multiple views before they sort of settle on one. It's very hard to beat for in-depth study, in my view. The ESV study Bible published by Crossway could be a little difficult to carry around, however. That's the only disadvantage. But hands down that one. And then real quick, I ain't said it in a while, so I got one real quick one from Mario. He asked, uh, lo or I'm sorry, that was Mario, Jose. Jose asked, uh, when do you know when you should basically cut somebody off or kick the dust off your feet when you're dealing with them in evangelism situations? My uh, response to that is I think Christians are too quick to pull the plug. I think our tendency is to kind of think, you know, our time is so valuable and these people don't, they're not worth our time and all this. I don't know how we know from looking on the outside and the surface of a situation who is near the kingdom in, in, in Jesus speak. Uh, if I would have seen... Saul, who later became the Apostle Paul, holding coats for people stoning Stephen, I'd be like, <laughs> that dude, he's probably never going to make it. Look, And then he's on the, the road to Damascus to do what? You know, the Bible says he was breathing out murderous threats against the Christians. Nobody would have thought he's close to the kingdom. And, and even in our era, in the 20th century, Tom Skinner, who was a gangster in Harlem, who the Lord brought to faith miraculously, or Nikki Cruz of the Mau Mau's in the 60s as well. Who would have thought they were close? But David Wilkerson and the people in Skinner's life kept on showing them the love of Christ. So my view is when you think it's been too much, just go a little bit more. Pray it through, see what happens. Let them pull the plug. I don't think we should be so quick to pull the plug. 
And at some point, I hope we can get another question from John McCray. I feel like it's been a while from him, but I think Cameron had something next. All right, so I've got a question from Stubadub. He says, how do you respond when an atheist says, at least atheists admit when they don't know something? So I'd say a couple of things in response to this. So first of all, I think that it depends on the atheist because a lot of atheists don't admit when they don't know something. It, it also depends on the claim itself. And then also it, a lot of theists that I know, a lot of Christian philosophers especially, and Mike even has some thoughts on this, a lot of Christian philosophers are very quick to admit when they don't know something. So it, it really depends on the context, who you're talking about, what atheist, what theist, what claim. But I think really what's, what's at the heart of this idea is that we don't want to, to be too strong with the claims that we make. Like, we don't want to go beyond what the evidence suggests. And so I think that sentiment is ultimately a good thing to think about. Like, you don't want to go too, too strong, basically. You don't want to go too far, further than what the evidence permits you to, to go. And so I think in, in, with respect to the arguments for God's existence and the evidence that we have for theism— IP talked about this a little bit earlier. I think that there are really good arguments and evidence for the truth of theism and for Christianity. And so really what it comes down to is what does the evidence suggest? But I think the, the evidence does suggest a lot. All right. And I have another question for uh, IP from Carmel Crunk. She says, how do you respond to atheists who say the burden of proof is on theists? Well, first of all, it, it to some degree it is we're saying that god does exist that is a positive claim but we're not just saying that we have offered evidence arguments from consciousness arguments uh, from the beginning of the universe cosmology arguments from quantum mechanics arguments from uh, moral realism we have put this big theory out there we've put a lot of this evidence out there the atheist just then can't say well I'm not convinced, and the burden is still on you. No, that's a subjective argument at that point. That's not how it works. We said we have presented all this evidence. The best explanation is a theistic worldview. Uh, if you can't offer a better explanation, we are justified in saying this is the best explanation. Watch how atheists argue against young earth creationists. Uh, they'll, young earth creationists will say, rock layers proof Noah's flood. Now, you may think that, but just go with me in this hypothetical. Uh, the atheists will say, no, I'm going to offer a better explanation. I think those rock layers were laid down millions of years. See, they're offering a better explanation for that. When it comes to the arguments for God's existence, they rarely, and I mean rarely, do that. It's all about, well, I'm just not convinced, or I don't know, or I don't think that gets you there. They're not doing the same. They're not playing the same game. It's a, it's a little bit, a little, you know, sweet. Yeah, a little, they'll try things like that. Make them offer a better explanation. We understand we have a burden of proof to meet. We offer arguments and evidence and say this is the best best explanation uh, they just can't turn around and go well i'm not convinced and therefore you're not right no that's not how it works if they can't offer you anything else we're justified in saying this is the best explanation yes yeah, so i got a super chat question from jose rivera appreciate it i uh, said there's a rise of atheism in the black community why um <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty weighty question because there's actually lots of different reasons i would say um, if I could list maybe a top three, number one would be essentially the problem of evil. Um, the reality is you can't give a robust response to the problem of evil in the African-American context without at some point intersecting with issues about race, racism, and oppression. And so I think traditionally uh, the church has done a great job in terms of taking like an action-oriented approach to engaging those kinds of things. So you can think about the civil rights movement and all that. All that. Um, with that being said, in terms of providing arguments and, and, and I, I guess uh, I'll just say argumentation, you know, to rebut the, the kinds of objections that are that are lobbed against us, it's a, it's almost like going to the gym where you're skipping leg day every week. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying the church is very top heavy, uh, I guess maybe in terms of the action oriented responses, but we've been skipping leg day in terms of our argumentation. And so I think that what needs to happen now is the church has to, uh, in the African American context, has to turn its attention toward uh, providing better answers I and mean, kind of pr uh, packaging. Uh, answers that, that people can relate to today and, and address that problem of evil. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so um, I, I, 
just another thing. I, I, some of you could see this. I, I want to be sensitive. I know some of you can think, oh, man, well, uh, you got to give a super chat to get your answers. Uh, it, it, you know, I'm new to these live things, but I've just been told that they go to the top. So <laughs> we have these super chats coming in. And so we're not trying to, uh, you know, at the end of the day, we're thankful for everything that you give. And we just want you to know we appreciate it. We're not trying to overlook any questions uh, at all. But we do have some of the super chats that are coming in. And we're just trying to recognize those as we don't have time to answer everything. Uh, I just saw one. Can eschatology be used as an apologetic, such as the Olivet Discourse? Uh, and then uh, another one, and that's from uh, the MS, the Miss Amrun. Thank you. And then another one, since a list of books would take too long, can you give a list of authors that address historical, scientific, and philosophical fields of apologetics? Um, Thomas Bortz. Um, uh, does anybody have uh, just a special uh, set of books offhand that you would want to recommend uh, as it relates to historical, scientific, and philosophical fields of apologetics? Some books you might have? John Lennox. Okay. Science John, everything. Okay, yeah. John Lennox, Can Science Prove... Uh, Everything. Yep. J.P. Moreland. Yeah, I was I was gonna say for philosophical apologetics, my favorite guy out there is J.P. Moreland, and particularly one book I think is it's really especially if you're if you're wanting to dive deeper into the philosophy, uh, his book uh, the recalcitrant Amago Dei, uh, where he talks about the human person and the failure of naturalism to account for these certain things like free will. Uh, consciousness, rationality, the soul, objective morality, intrinsic value, I think is a really good philosophical work in apologetics and, and shows how naturalism can't account for these irreducible facts. Awesome. I had a question asked several times about how can someone be delivered from sinful lust. Go to our um, podcast. <clears throat> I have two interviews with a guy by the name of Stephen Black who came out of homosexuality years ago, and he said three things are necessary. You have to, he, he put it in an acronym. You have to have strong abs. You have to have accountability with people that you trust. You have to have boundaries, and you have to have a spiritually devoted life, A, B, S. So you have to get into Scripture. You have to go to Scriptures like Romans 6 and Romans 7, and you just have to get closer to Jesus. I know that sounds trite, but it's true. So you have to have accountability, boundaries, and a spiritually devoted life. He handed it to me because of my good abs. <laughs> Why are you laughing? What's over? Anyway, um, quick shout out to Andrew Tam, who's in China, and said, "Hi, David and Minions. Thank you for all your do uh, thank you for doing what you do. I'm based in China, and I'm locked in due to the coronavirus epidemic. Your videos are great for keeping up my family's morale. So uh, glad we could help." Um, Andrew uh, did get several questions on why there are no women here. Um, and are, are women even allowed in apologetics? Why are there no, why are there no women here? Uh, just keep in mind, this, was, this, is, this is the first meeting, and we were blessed that a, an anonymous, uh, very, very famous sports figure allowed us to use his house to get together. But since we we're all going to be staying in the same house, um, it was kind of if, if someone had a wife, like Bobby brought his wife and so on. But we didn't want to bring in a um, bunch of you know, women apologists and all of us be, be, sharing, be sharing the same house. Yeah, that that's true. That's true. That that that, that would be okay then. Um, so for the for the for the future for the future we would love we would have and if you go to CIA if you go to CIA you'll know that uh, there are plenty of uh, women speakers in apologetics although not nearly enough so if you're interested uh, certainly get involved for the future when we get together for meetings like this we'll yeah we'll need a slightly different setup but we'd be happy to do that. Uh, question was from Mrs. Apostate. Uh, Mrs. Apostate is the apostate prophet's wife. That's a, he's an atheist channel, but uh, if you want to know about Islam, he's a former Muslim, puts out awesome content, so be, be sure to subscribe to the apostate prophet. Uh, but Mrs. Apostate said, do you think it's possible that the gospel story was a fictional work based on the Old Testament, just as the Chronicles of Narnia was a fictional work inspired by the gospel? No, do not regard that as, uh, I mean, you could say logically possible or something like that, but not, not historically possible. Um, one, we have multiple authors. We have multiple sources, uh, not just one. Two, 
when we can look at the various things that we can verify historically from their writings, there's just too much there. If you try to verify details of the Chronicles of Narnia, you're going to come up very, very short. So multiple authors, multiple sources, and it's not just sources from friends. You have uh, foes like the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Paul who went to Jesus' original followers and verified uh, the message that he'd received by revelation to make sure that it lined up with history. So that's just completely, completely different from what you'd have with something like uh, the Chronicles of Narnia. So thanks for that, um, Mrs. Apostate. I wanted to make sure we came back to that super chat, and it was the question, can eschatology be used as an apologetic such as the Olivet Discourse? The Olivet Discourse is seen in Matthew 24, 25, and depending upon one's eschatological viewpoint uh, that they take, they'll interpret the Olivet Discourse differently. I think as it relates to doing apologetics uh, versus maybe eschatology, I think that we would do apologetics around Christ's first coming, his incarnation, his death, his burial, his resurrection. As it relates to future prophecy, I think that we can build out a good apologetic on the fact that we can count on him coming again because he kept his promises to come the first time. So that would just be a simple way that I would answer that. Anyone else ready to answer the questions? Yeah, real quick, I just want to, I got a question from a uh, atheist fan favorite. Pine Creek is in the building. Uh, he asks, do you think that more people would become Christians if apologists use 1 Kings 18 as a template on how to evangelize, i.e. pray in Jesus' name to light up uh, water-soaked wood? So how I respond to that is, um, well, first of all, I think as somebody who purports to have been a form, you know, purports to be a former Christian to be well-versed in theology, I would think he probably should know how I'm going to answer this question, but you know, perhaps not. I guess maybe have to have been banned by Mike Winger and David Wood. <laughs> maybe you're trying to test the new guy. I don't. I don't know. You know, maybe that's what it is. But anyway, uh, I would refer to uh, Romans 1:16. The, the gospel is the power of God into salvation. So, I can't think of any better way to preach the gospel and, and see people convert than to um, stick to what's prescribed in the New Testament. So that's that's how I would answer that question. Shout out to you. Thanks for uh, hopping on my channel. But Adam does do that in a way because all of his arguments are fire. <laughs> all right, a <laughs> question. <laughs> oh, sorry. I had a question, um, and this was about uh, the Hebrew Roots Movement. I'll read the question here from uh, Colin Bassard. I have some family members that are in the Hebrew Roots Movement and uh, trying to teach me and others how to follow the law. How do I talk to them about it, or should I avoid the subject? I don't think you should avoid the subject. Um, now, I may be wrong. There are scenarios in which maybe you should avoid the subject. But I have, a, I have a full series on the Hebrew Roots Movement. If you go to my YouTube channel, there's a playlist called Help for the Hebrew Roots Movement. That's the playlist. All my videos on, are on, on it are there, and it's thoroughly researched and lots of content. Personally, I like Acts 15. Um, and you can see me in my second video, I go through the book of Acts, or third video in the series, go through the book of Acts and all that stuff. What I recommend, though, is you need to, you need to pick whatever passage of Scripture you want to focus on you need to know your argument, you need to know their arguments, and you need to know your responses to their arguments. Then start the conversation with them. And you can do that in my videos, because that's what I did. I, I gave both sides and the responses and the rebuttals in those videos. I like Acts 15 again. In short, Acts 15, it works like this with the Hebrew Roots Movement. This is the idea that you, ha you as a Christian are supposed to obey the law of the Old Testament. Um, Acts 15 says they don't have to obey the law of the Old Testament. It's very clear. It's a council in Jerusalem where they proclaim they don't have to obey it. The rescue device the Hebrew Roots Movement has is to simply say, yeah, but those were only new believers. This is the only rescue device they have. These were new believers. They were eventually going to be taught the law of Moses. And so you respond to that by showing in the book of Acts, and I do this in the video so you can have like a platform or a, a, an example of that. Um, you just show in the video that the believers in, in Antioch, the location they're writing a letter to, these believers had been well discipled for years by apostles and prophets. They're not new believers. So I like to ask that person, um, so your understanding of Acts 15 depends on these being new believers, right? And wait until they say yes. And they have to say yes, because that's the only way out of this passage. Then you take them to those passages earlier in Acts, show they're not new believers, they're well discipled, and then there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, that's just one passage. There's many that would refute it, and I have a lot of them in that series. Yeah. Again, for everybody who are watching this over there, make sure that you go into the description, follow every channel on YouTube, make sure that you support them, may, keep leaving your questions. We have another 10 minutes to go. 
David Wood is going to close us out and make sure that you continue to follow the Apologetics Empire. Uh, we have a lot of good stuff coming up, and you're going to see uh, our videos, uh, how they're going to go to the next level. So keep praying for us. If you cannot support us financially, that's fine, but we do covet your prayers. We need your prayers for us to continue to do this. Um, the devil knows what's, what's coming, and he is sure to attack us. He's always looking out to to um, destroy what, what, what we're building here. So we want your prayers. We want your continued support. Make sure that you join our newsletter letters, subscribe, and, and support. So that was that was all. So who was next? Well, we got a question for David here. David? He, he, or? He's, he's our main he's Yeah. Our okay. Huh? Oh, sorry. All right. So um, this may be the same one for David. I'll tag on to the, to the end of this. If, um, first one was, uh, had a question from uh, Joshua LeClear asking, how has the Army changed my view um, on theology and my worldview? And so for those of you that don't know, I saw quite a bit of combat, and we have another brother here tonight with us who's, who's also a veteran, so he may want to jump in on that. But actually, it just set a fire on, under my rear end. Uh, two things, as soon as I got back from, got ret retired out, was that I have no problem telling a, another grown man, hey, I love you, brother, uh, because life's too short. And so that was something that, that I just, I don't care. Uh, obviously, that's meant in a manly way. Um, but the, the second thing is that it also really prompted me to start trying to share the gospel as much as I could in any way I possibly could. And a lot of that just comes through, for me, uh, relationships. But I tried to make that a priority. And uh, something that somebody said to me once is, look, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And so that was an absolute priority for me uh, upon getting back stateside. The question that I have for Woods and, and Brother David, you don't even necessarily probably, you could probably answer this with a video, I would think, but it's from uh, uh, Paula Eastman, who came out of Islam, and I think is a Christian now, asking how to respond to, I believe it was Ahmed Didat, if I remember the, the question correctly, and I'm betting you've probably got some videos on that, but Paula would like to, to deal with that. Yeah, you're not going to be able to do that, but I figured maybe you would might have some recommendations of videos. Um, so what's what's happened on my live stream here is uh, there's an individual that's really been asking a lot of questions, genuinely wanting to know how to deal with the dual accounts that uh, where did uh, Jesus go when he was born. One account says <clears throat> that he went to Egypt, uh, you know, and then another account talks about him going off to Nazareth and just trying to figure out how do you reconcile the Matthew Luke account there. And so I know you come up with some of the stuff in your conversations with the Muslims, and I thought you'd do good answering it. So here you go. All right. So uh, on, on the on the issue of Ahmed Didat, um, I would just say listen to what he says and then read the pa read the Bible passage he's talking about and watch what happens. Um, I haven't made a lot of uh, I'm not sure I've made any videos about DDOT. I've made a bunch of videos about Zakir Naik, which those responses usually apply to DDOT as well, because Zakir Naik got them from DDOT. So uh, you can see all kinds of problems there. Um, but uh, on the on the issue, so the, the issue was the, the dual account. So basically, if you're reading Matthew and you're reading Luke, uh, the claim is, well, in Matthew, they go to Egypt after Bethlehem, and in Luke, they go to Nazareth after Bethlehem. And I just want to point out, no, according to both accounts, they go to Nazareth. Matthew simply includes a trip to Egypt. And so if you regard that as a, as a contradiction, then you're going to find all kinds of contradictions because that's just something normal that we do when we're telling stories. We can leave things out that are irrelevant to the point we're trying to make. Um, we, can, we can shorten stories. It's called telescoping, right? You, you, you shorten the stories because, you know, you only have a limited amount of space to write. Uh, but th this happens all the time. If I'm, uh, if, I'm telling, if I'm sharing my testimony, right? If I'm sharing my testimony, it might happen in many different ways, depending on how long I have to tell the story and uh, which details I'm trying to emphasize. So if I say, you know, hey, I attacked my dad and then I went to jail and in jail I met a friend and so on. Notice I'm leaving out a lot of stuff that happened, right? Because if I'm telling it and I have a little more time, I'll say, I, I, you know, I attacked my dad and then I went to a mental hospital, which is true. And then I'll say, then I went to jail. 
What I almost never do is tell the exact order of events because that would be very time consuming and it would be pretty irrelevant to the points I'm trying to make. So if I wanted to include all the details, I'd have to say, uh, after I attacked my dad, I was taken to a mental hospital, then I was taken to jail, then I got, then I got, yeah, then I got, then I got bailed out of jail and was outside, then I was taken back to jail, then I was taken to a, another mental hospital, then I was taken back to jail, that's when I met Randy and then continue the story. Now notice, if you wanted to point this out as a contradiction that, oh, here David says that he attacked his dad, then he went to jail. And here he says he attacked his dad and then, he, and then went to a mental hospital and then went to jail. And here, when he's giving all the details, it's he went here, then here, then here, then here, then here, then here, then jail. Um, that's not, I'm not lying here and this not a contradiction. That's just leaving out a bunch of stuff that's irrelevant. So if Luke is trying to emphasize uh, you know, he's trying to emphasize what he wants. He wants the, the, the birth account and so on. And then he wants to get to another important event and just wants to fast forward to Jesus and Nazareth. Whereas Matthew wants to emphasize this brief trip to Egypt because uh, he is trying to show that, it, that it, there's a fulfilled prophecy about his son, God's son coming out of Egypt. Then they're going to emphasize different things. And I just wouldn't regard that as a, as a contradiction at all. It, again, if you do, anyone who's telling a story of his life in multiple different ways, is going to have all kinds of contradictions like this. So they're, they're just not contradictions. Just to end, uh, just to end the stream, um, we got one question for everybody. We're going to let Cameron Bertuzzi uh, bring it up. And then from that, we're going to end up with David, a few words by David Wood. And uh, here you go. So the question that I have is from Maverick Christian. He's a good friend of mine. He was on my channel recently. He says, question for each person, Each person, what is your favorite argument for God's existence? I'm just going to be quick. I'm not going to give an explanation of it. Mine is the argument from contingency. So we'll just pass it on. Uh, transcendental argument for God's existence. Uh, variations of the moral argument. Uh, I, I think the moral argument would be my favorite. Uh, the moral argument. The moral argument is most relevant. You get most questions on the moral argument. I like the cosmological argument, though, because it gives you the most attributes of God. I would make an argument on the irrationality of the contrary. Uh, probably the argument from consciousness or the contingency argument, maybe the Kalam. I don't know. I like a lot of them. Well, I'll, I'll say the, the moral argument, um, and obviously, you know, it connects with people if you've really uh, been through some suffering, right? So I'm sure that you've been through that. So My followers will know what I'm going to say. It's the emergent universe of the digital physics argument. You want to know more? See my video, The Emergent Universe. I'd say the fine-tuned argument. I, I think that order is obvious to most people, and it can't come from chaos. Um, I'm, I hate to say I don't have a favorite. It kind of depends on the person I'm talking to, but I would lean towards the moral argument if, if you push me into a corner. Uh, that, that would be too, but <laughs> man, <laughs> it's funny how that worked out. But I, I guess if I had to pick one, either Aquinas' fifth way or the Kalam, which is two, so there you go. Wait, there's one more question here. No, I'm just kidding. All right, so we closing out now? Is that what we're doing, Jorge? Yes, sir. All right, well, been a great day. You know, there's been a lot of great days in history. You know that? <laughs> this day that Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It's a great day, you know? There's the day that Martin Luther King Jr. said, I have a dream. The day Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death. And then... There's a day that all these Christian YouTubers got together to figure out how we can work together and help the next generation that's coming along. So be prepared to look back on this great day.